With number 22, Eugene Mercury Morris, back in the lineup after missing opening day, the Miami Dolphins expected to return to their Olympian heights. But the Blue Mountain Mercury tried to scale proved a tough match, and the swift one ended up flat on his back. Then while the Buffalo Buffalo walked all over a dolphin effigy, Mercury in returning to the huddle ended up flat on his front. The shaking up was only temporary though, and after a short departure, Mr. Morris would return. <laughs> Meanwhile, his Buffalo counterpart, O.J. Simpson, was running beautifully, but carrying poorly. Luckily, number 27, Ahmad Rashad, covered for O.J., and the home team garnered seven anyway. Another Buffalo bright spot was the improved passing of number 12, Joe Ferguson, who hit J.D. Hill in the end zone for another Bills score. For the second week in a row, the Dolphins were less than impressive making uncharacteristic mental and physical miscues like this Mercury Morris fumble with alarming frequency. While the Dolphins stumbled and fumbled, so did the Bills, as the usually reliable O.J. squirted the ball loose as much in this game as he usually does in a season. O.J.'s mistake proved costly when Bob Greasy was able to fire the ball to number 88, Jim Mandich, who looted a cleverly disguised Buffalo defender for the touchdown. Greasy continued to move his team in close and then popped short passes into the end zone. This one to number 80, Marv Fleming, put the Dolphins on top to stay. Then Mercury Mountain Climber Morris found an easier route over and threw the Bills to wrap up the Miami victory 24 to 16. And finally, the world champs looked like world champs. Don Shula's Dolphins wanted an early edge on the Chargers, so on the game's second play from scrimmage, Bob Greasy hit tight end Jim Mandich, and Mandich took off. Arrow Yuprimian had a field goal blocked, so the Dolphins had to wait until the second quarter to take the lead on Larry Zonka's roughhouse run. Number 14, Dan Fouts, brought San Diego back to a halftime tie with a last-minute pass to number 89, six-foot-seven-inch tight end Wayne Stewart. In the third period, Bob Greasy and the Dolphins found out that they were in for serious trouble for the rest of the afternoon. Before they knew what hit them, the Dolphins were behind 21 to seven on two touchdowns by Don Woods, number 33, a rookie from New Mexico Highland. 
Don Woods carried 18 times for 157 yards, and the Chargers were charging. Down by two touchdowns, the Dolphins' task looked even tougher when they lost Mercury Morris for the rest of the day. In the fourth quarter, needing three scores to win, Bob Greasy looked for and found help from a new source. Wide receiver Nat Moore, number 89. The five foot nine and a half inch rookie from Florida accounted for most of the distance as Miami closed to within one touchdown midway through the final period. On the next Miami series, the key play was a third and eight call, which went for 38 yards into the good hands of Jim Mandich. The final 16 yards to the end zone were covered in two thrusts by Larry Zonka. And then with just 15 seconds remaining, Zonka's old buddy Jim Kick scored again. And instead of a second loss, Miami had a second victory and was one step closer to a third consecutive world championship. In 1974, Miami came alive at night. Bright lights found the Dolphins at their best. Against the New York Jets, Bob Greasy filled the night air with footballs to tight end Jim Mandich. Miami took an early lead, but then the Jets came back behind another night person, Joe Namath. Namath brought New York to within four points. Then no name took over. All during an anxious fourth quarter, Namath kept taking shots at the end zone, and no name kept breaking them up. In the end, Miami rolled right over Joe and the Jets for a 21-17 victory. Washington summoned their version of the Cavalry early against Miami as number nine, Sonny Jergensen, drew his first starting assignment of the season. Famous for a cool head and a buggy whip release, the 40-year-old master cracked out medium gainers through the Dolphin zones early. But during the first half, while Sonny would exceed the century mark in passing, the Miami defense remained resolute, refusing to allow the Redskins a single point and three times forcing Jurgensen to throw interceptions. Number 25, Tim Foley, shut off Washington's most promising drive of the first half with a key end zone theft. However, within the opening 30 minutes, the Dolphins could manage but one score, which came on a short pop by number 33, Hubert Ginn, for a halftime lead of 7-0. The Redskin defense set the tenor of the second half. Both clubs managed only a field goal amid the third quarter struggle before a Sonny Jurgensen missile sounded the beginning to a furious finish. Jurgensen's guided projectile homed in on Roy Jefferson for a touchdown and coupled with a field goal, forced Bob Greasy and the Dolphins to overcome a 13-10 lead. Greasy responded with a 48-yarder to number 89, Nat Moore, but from the Redskin 13-yard line, faced a crucial third and 11 within the final two minutes.
Howard Twilley's catch brought the Dolphins the lead, 17-13. And with barely a minute remaining, George Allen was afire with comeback fever. A fever fueled on by the searing darts from his ace, Sonny Jurgensen. With less than 20 seconds remaining and no more timeouts, Sonny had one last chance. Number 38, Larry Smith, barely crossed the imaginary plane of the end zone to complete a 2017 Washington victory. The win was but further evidence of the sheer greatness of a healthy Christian Adolph Sonny Jurgensen, which when added to a solid team effort, helped to keep the Redskins within striking distance of the streaking St. Louis Cardinals. The Chiefs opened up with some early punch in Miami last week as Woody Green, number 27, showed up healthy and fast. The rookie from Arizona State also showed enough moves to give the Kansas City offense the perk it has needed this year. So how many points did the Chiefs roll up? Three. Meanwhile, the Dolphins themselves were unexciting as they unabashedly stayed on the ground and were virtually unscoring, garnering a mere two points throughout three periods. Bob Greasy did try the sky route. He was shot down three times by the likes of number 20, Mike Sensabaugh. And then there were times when not only couldn't Greasy find a receiver, but he even had trouble finding a place to lay down. Miami's two points came on a blocked punt that trickled out of the end zone. It was one of the few good plays pulled off by the Dolphins who have either lost their greatness or have placed a strict ration on it because each week they look a little less like the powerful world champions of yesteryear. Finally, they did come up with a big play on a greasy to number 89 Nat Moore strike that appeared six point bound. But alas, Moore had stepped out of bounds and the score remained at three to two until the last 21 seconds when Larry Zonka powered in to eke out a nine to three Dolphin victory. And if a loss can be a moral victory in some cases, then Miami's victory could be considered a moral loss. In the Orange Bowl, the Frisky Colts kicked up their horseshoes and tried to stomp Larry Zonka into the poly turf. But it wasn't a pad-popping stick that did Zonka in, but the treacherous green carpet that refused to yield to Zonka's change of direction. Miami not only lost the ball, but Zonka for the game with a badly wrenched ankle. Clinging to a tenuous three-point lead, quarterback Bob Greasy went for six with a rainbow to rookie receiver Mel Baker. The bomb to Baker was a stride too long, and like a fish out of water, the Dolphins looked like an easy catch as Baltimore drew the net tighter on mighty Miami. The Colts gained a 7-3 lead on setback Don McCauley's surprise pass to Glenn Dowdy. But Miami roared back on touchdowns by veteran Don Nottingham and rookie Benny Malone, number 32. Malone's pretty 23-yard score iced a 17-7 comeback victory. 
as Miami remained in contention one game behind New England and Buffalo in the AFC East. It was picture day last Saturday for the Dolphins, and for the first time this season, they had at least the resemblance of team unity. Curiously enough, the following day against the Atlanta Falcons was the second time this season they once again had the resemblance of team unity. And as in days of old, the no-namers were in absolute control. Due to injuries, the backfield has been diminished in both size and speed. But as number 36 Don Nottingham showed, not in desire. Nottingham's run set up Benny Malone for the touchdown, and it was Miami 7, Atlanta 0. On the following series, Bob Lee's trigger finger was hastened by the Miami rush, and his misfire was earmarked for interception. Dick Anderson made the steal, but for an all-pro, it was just too easy to get excited about. Having regained possession, the offense showed they deserved it, as number 89, Nat Moore, did some real nice trucking. At the four-yard line, Bob Greasy just eased back and threw right between one lineman's hands into the matchless mitts of Paul Warfield for a 14-point advantage. It was not a complete shutout for Atlanta, however, and the primary reason for that was the darting figure of number 43, Dave Hampton. But when you get right down to it, Atlanta wouldn't have scored at all if it hadn't been for three major penalties and a super catch by number 41, Al Dodd. Finally, number 43, Dave Hampton, found a wee speck of daylight, and the Falcons avoided a shutout. It was a big day for Bob Greasy as he executed play action superbly and passed even better. Greasy was 10 for 15 on the afternoon, but the real nitty gritty was this 51 yarder to peerless Paul Warfield. It was an important catch for Miami as it marked Warfield's return from more than a month of injury. With the defense turning over yet another possession, Greasy turned his heavy artillery downrange once again. And he found number 88, Jim Mandich, to make it Dolphins 28, Atlanta 7. With both Larry Zarka and Mercury Morris sidelined with injuries, the Miami backfield has been thought of only in makeshift terms. But last Sunday, number 32, Benny Malone's 24 carries for 108 yards were big league in anybody's book. And once in close, Don Nottingham's three touchdowns were certainly as Zonka-esque as the real thing. And after the little Cypriot tiemaker added the final point to Miami's 42-7 route of Atlanta, one could feel the unmistakable return of Dolphins' super team togetherness. When the Dolphins arrived in New Orleans last Sunday, who could blame them for being confident? Despite numerous injuries, they were winning, and now they had back their almost indefensible big play battery, Bob Greasy, to Paul Warfield. Mercury Morris, just off both the injured list and the suspended list, again did not play. His substitute, number 32, rookie Benny Malone, again did play, and again showed the reckless style which had gained over 100 yards in each of his two previous games. With the running game running hot, Bob Greasy faked a run and threw over the Saints' goal line defense to tight end Jim Mandich. The first two times the Dolphins had the ball, Greasy marched them to easy touchdowns. The second on a perfect post-pattern pass to rookie receiver Nat Moore, number 89. In the second quarter, Greasy again fooled the Saints' goal line defense with a play-action pass to Jim Mandich and the Dolphins led comfortably 21 to nothing. The Saints could muster few offensive threats until the second half, 
when Archie Manning took matters into his own hands. Twice, Archie had the Saints marching in, but both times something devilish happened. First, Bob Matheson, the 53 in Miami's 53 defense, intercepted inside the 10. The only other time the Saints came close, they were stopped four times inside the five. The Miami shutout was preserved 21 to nothing, and for Archie and the Saints, the frustration of yet another losing season was just too painful to endure. at the Miami 41-yard line. But number 84, Bill Stanfield, then reclaimed eight yards of Miami territory. It was a tremendous series for Stanfield, as on the following play, he howled in once more, and suddenly the Bills were facing fourth and 29 at the Buffalo 40. and the man you'd guess least likely to err coughed up the ball on the Bills 17 yard line. Another profile of Mr. Simpson's fumble shows number 32 carrying the ball in anything but a protective manner as for the second time this year against Miami, OJ turned over the ball near his own goal. Taking possession on the Buffalo 35, Bob Greasy didn't waste any time as he zapped the pass to number 89, Nat Moore, who trudged all the way down to the Buffalo nine-yard line. From there, however, the Dolphins almost got blown right out of the water as number 43, safety Tony Green, stepped in front of Paul Warfield to begin the season's longest interception return. Five yards later, Mr. Green was an exhausted figure in the Miami end zone. But Green was not half as tired as he was disappointed when he learned a penalty had nullified his performance. There were certainly no complaints from Miami as Zonka slanted into the Bills' end zone for the game's first score and a 7-0 advantage over the snake-bit Buffalo Bills. Soon afterward, Joe Ferguson was trying to generate some offense by doing all he could to allocate more time for Buffalo receivers to work against the Miami zone. But after leaving his protective pocket, the attacked men of the Dolphin defense bore in to reap yet another sack. Keith shows Greasy's classic form as he dropped deep behind leak-proof protection before stepping up to heave the bomb to Paul Warfield, who had one step on number 42, Neil Craig, and that was good enough for a touchdown. As the half ended, the Orange Bowl was once more fluttering with thousands of victory symbol handkerchiefs, as it was understood that the Dolphins were only one half away from gaining sole possession of the AFC's Eastern Division lead. Greasy never saw completed was indeed a strike. In fact, Paul Warfield had two steps on number 28, Dwight Harrison, for a play which covered 54 yards. That's 54 yards plus the penalty against Edwards, which put the Dolphins in goal position at the Buffalo six yard line. From there, a weak side trap blown open by Larry Little let Larry Zonka for once ease into the end zone to gain a 21-7 advantage over the Buffalo Bills. 
touchdowns with just over a quarter to play, Ferguson was forced to go airborne. But not only couldn't he locate a receiver, he nearly lost the ball when number 84, Bill Stanfield, beat his blocker and smacked down Ferguson hard. Alver Hagen saved the Bills, but though Miami had lost a chance for a big break, Buffalo had lost much more. On the play, Ferguson injured his knee and was forced to leave the game. For now, Greasy decided to go up top, but he could find no receiver open and scrambled for 11 yards before being scrambled himself. Looking at the play from another angle, we can see that Greasy again felt pressure from number 73, Earl Edwards. And to avoid yet another confrontation with the big end, Greasy hoofed it, only to run into another crunching tackle. After two runs gained but one yard, Greasy was again forced to throw. He did not get a completion, but he got 31 yards when Robert James interfered with Nat Moore, wiping out Neil Craig's interception and putting the Dolphins in close. From the Buffalo 11, Don Nottingham made his first contribution to Don Shula's genius rating. Miami led again, this time 28-21, with five minutes to play. Oh. First down, Greasy drops straight back and hit Warfield for his third big play, good for 31 yards. Looking at the play from our end zone camera reveals that Greasy got time and threw a perfect pass in between two Buffalo defenders. The play is a classic example of hitting the seam of the zone. Greasy next hit Jim Kick for another first down, then gave him the ball on a run that yielded yet another first on the Bills' 23. Let's look at the play again, for it may well have won the game for the Dolphins. When Kick was met early, number 59, Buffalo linebacker Doug Allen, converged toward the stack. And when Kick broke free, Allen was no longer outside, enabling Kick to beat it around Allen for 15 yards. Kick's heady run carried to the Bills 23, well within Garrow Epremian's field goal range. Now just 24 seconds remained, and the Dolphins would surely stay on the ground, not risking an interception before the inevitable field goal. Greasy noticed that the Bills, hoping to force a loss, had a blitz on and called an audible at the line. It was the right call. Don Nottingham popped through clean and Miami had won 35-28. For those of you who remember the Dolphins as that team that treated their success on the football field with the same exhilaration as a man on his way to the dentist, witness them now. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus, and yes, the Dolphins really can get emotional. There was good reason for this final bit of uncharacteristic Dolphin behavior. They had been involved in one of the truly great finishes in recent football history. The fourth quarter of the Bills-Dolphins game had seen five, count them, five touchdowns and as much action as few entire games contain. And of course, there was the fact that for the first time this season, the Miami Dolphins held undisputed possession of first place in the AFC East. It has been a trying season for Don Shula, mostly because 11 different starters, four on defense and seven on offense, have missed games due to injuries. 
The last week against Joe and the Jets, the Dolphins appeared at first to have everything under control. After a close inspection of the Shea Stadium turf, Joe Namath decided it was time for a little landscaping. Having established a firm foothold, Namath accounted for the only score of the first half with a play-action rollout pass to his 6'5 tight end Rich Caster, number 88. The third period belonged to another number 12, Bob Gracie, whose style is substantially different from Joe Namath's. Bob Greasy can scramble and he can run. Last Sunday, when he saw a way to the end zone, he ran for it. Greasy's touchdown tied the game at seven, and except for a New York field goal, there was no more scored until midway in the fourth period, when Greasy threw a lateral pass to wide receiver Nat Moore who did a pretty good job of getting the ball downfield to the other wide receiver, Paul Warfield. From the six, Greasy turned what appeared to be a broken play into an easy six-pointer to Jim Kick. Miami led 14 to 10, but with five minutes left in the game, Joe Namath turned the clock back about a half a dozen years. As number 88 Rich Caster said after the game, we showed them a formation they hadn't seen all day. They got mixed up and I got wide open behind them. Caster's sixth reception and second touchdown gave the Jets a 17-14 lead, but there was still plenty of time for Bob Greasy and the Dolphins to come back. For the second week in a row, number 47, Roscoe Word, killed off a final drive with an interception. The Jets had their third straight victory and the Dolphins, their third loss of the season. More losses than in the two previous seasons combined. While the Jets may have deserved the victory, the Dolphins can blame no one but themselves for the loss. For in the game, they committed numerous undolphin-like errors, including seven penalties and four fumbles. One by the usually sure-handed Larry Zonka, and two by equally sure-handed Jake Scott, who nullified the effectiveness of his two interceptions. The Miami errors were not limited to the offense and defense, for the usually impeccable Dolphin special teams also aired at least four times. Perhaps the most telling error came with two minutes remaining, when for the second time in the game, the Dolphins were denied the ball because of running into the punter. There are many reasons why one team wins or another loses, and no one knows this better than Don Shula and a new winner named Charlie. The night air seemed to bring out smiles and Miami invincibility. In a twilight game against Atlanta, the Dolphins took their cue to blitz in and bury the Falcons. The offense flew on the winged feet of Nat Moore. Everything came together as the offensive line blocked and Don Nottingham blasted for a resounding 42-7 triumph. But the Dolphins' finest team effort came under the lights against Cincinnati. The Bengals had to win for a playoff spot, but Don Shula had his ball control offense back in high gear.
Zonka shredded the Cincinnati defense. And when the running game turned lame, Greasy to Mandich went back on the air. The offense scored 24 points. The defense allowed just three as Curtis Johnson scooped up one of four Bengal fumbles. Yes, bright lights brought back the good times, but the Dolphin defense weathered its storms too. Throughout the 74 season, the Miami Dolphins have labored under the sternest of pressures in their quest for an unprecedented third consecutive world championship. They have won often this year, but often unconvincingly. And last Sunday, their struggle against the Colts in many ways reflected the story of their season. Bob Greasy got his teammates underway on their first possession with a no-nonsense strike to Jim Mandich, good for 20 yards. Then Greasy handed the pigskin to Cyclone Benny Malone, who after he opened his eyes, wrapped off some tough yardage. After Malone's excursion, Bob Greasy very coolly waited in his protective pocket until someone got open. And sure enough, number 81, Howard Twilley, turned up unescorted, and it was suddenly Dolphin 7, Colts nothing. And while the Colts were experiencing somewhat of a defensive breakdown, their Miami counterparts were putting it all together to make life singularly miserable for Burt Jones. The defense's biggest play, however, came when number 38, Bill Olds, fumbled directly into the always eager hands of number 40, Dick Anderson, who took it all the way back to the Colt 35-yard line. From there, Greasy tossed to Paul Warfield, who absorbed two very high-impact shots as the Dolphins drove to a 14-point lead. On the next series, however, the Colts commenced the comeback as Jones to number 81, Roger Carr, covered 57 yards. But the Dolphins were quick to regroup, and Burt Jones and friends were smitten by an unyielding Miami goal line defense. Not until the fourth quarter did things brighten up for the Colts, and number 30, Stan White, led the way as he picked off a greasy aerial to put the Colts in business at the Dolphin 38-yard line. One play later, number 38, Bill Olds, had the Colts 34 yards closer with a ramble to the Miami four-yard line. From there, the Colts could manage but a third field goal, but the score was now getting very competitive at 17 to 9. Once again, an opponent had found hope, and as world champions, the Dolphins faced yet another inspired challenge. Burt Jones propelled his 11th hour drive primarily on the catch and run ability of number 26, Lydell Mitchell. 13 plays and five minutes later, Burt Jones rolled right and pitched to Bill Olds to trail by just a point. But a point was all the Dolphins needed as they did just enough to clinch victory number 10 and division title number four. It had been a long, hard fall from possible playoff contention to non-contender, but the New England Patriots aren't without an excuse. Injuries to starting personnel, coupled with one of the league's toughest schedules, have left their Cinderella season without the glass slipper from which to sip the champagne of champions. So early against the Dolphins, number 16, Jim Plunkett, set out to earn the Patriots a respectable ending to a year of frustration. Plunkett engineered New England to the Miami three-yard line, where one of their least-used plays gave them the lead. 
New England received a break when offensive guard John Hanna covered Plunkett's miscue in the end zone for seven points. Then the Patriots' defense forced a six-point turnover out of the usually error-free Dolphins. Number 25, John Sanders, returned Earl Morrill's throw for a second New England touchdown. And when Miami fumbled away the following kickoff, a Jim Plunkett to Mac Heron connection placed New England ahead by 21 points. It was the second quarter and 24 to nothing before Earl Morrill and the Dolphins finally began to play some football. In the 90 seconds prior to halftime, the Dolphins produced a field goal and two touchdowns, one of which came when Morrill spied rookie Melvin Baker, number 82, 37 yards downfield. Trailing by a touchdown in the third quarter, Earl Morrill went back to a good thing, number 82, Melvin Baker. Baker's second touchdown knotted the score at 24, but New England soon regained the lead on a field goal. And then the patented Dolphins comeback began to take form. The first step being provided on a long distance kickoff return by number 32 rookie Benny Malone. Miami's first lead of the day came when Don Nottingham completed a short march with a short score and added with another field goal gave the Floridians a 34 to 27 lead. But the Patriots were far from through, due mainly to their all-purpose gutsy little runner Mac Heron, number 42. On a 10-yard trip around right in, Minnie Mac Heron broke the NFL record for total yards in the season held by Gail Sayers. His final sum amounted to 2,444 yards gained by rushing, pass receiving, and kick returning. Heron's heroics weren't enough to give his squad the victory, however, as the Miami Dolphins edged the New England Patriots 34-27. An inexperienced Miami team had come to Oakland for its first playoff game in history. Now, four years later, the two-time world champions returned to be mocked by a black handkerchief salute. On the opening kickoff, Miami saluted back. Nat Moore's brilliant 89-yard return set the stage for one of the greatest gains in NFL history.
Miami down 21 to 19 with only four minutes left, the determined Dolphins came back one more time. The impossible dream had ended. A classic struggle had run out of time with Oakland on top, 28 to 26. But there was no disgrace in defeat. Miami accepted their loss as they had welcomed their victories with dignity and heads held high. Don Chula looks toward the future for the Dolphin dynasty did not die in Oakland. New goals await to be set and accomplished, and dreams for the future are the grandest of all. <laughs>